imagine you were interested in music. Does anyone here like music? Anyone heard of music? Oh, okay, yes. So you like music, okay, great. Imagine you've got to know, these days we have, we've all got great um, uh, digital stuff. But imagine the old days you had uh, you know, those big speakers, those big woofers, you know, and big speakers, and you had your CD player and, and everything, and you had the best sound system in your suburb. In fact, all of your neighbors were well aware that you had the best sound system in the suburb. But imagine if all you had was one Patsy Klein CD. I don't know if you know who Patsy Klein is. She's, a, she's quite good. I mean, if you like that sort of thing, I fall to pieces all day, or D-I-B-O-R-C-E. But uh, she's an American uh, country singer, and great. But, but not enough by itself to give you musical satisfaction. Uh, so what do you do? You collect a repertoire of software, a library of software. So you have this kind of music when you want to be in this mood. You have that kind of music when you want to be in that mood. You can have uh, world music, you can have local music, international music, pop music. You can have, uh, you know, the classics. And you can even have spoken word uh, lectures, TED lectures and so on. So it's the software that gives us the, the, the value, the value from our hardware is created by the software. Now, the problem when we come to thinking is that the main software, well, certainly we use in the Western world, it varies a little bit, but it's similar, but the main software that we have in the Western world for thinking is 2,500 years old. Now, I don't know how often you upgrade your, uh, your iPhone apps, but I'm sure you've uh, upgraded your software, you know, at least in the last five years. Anyone not upgraded their laptop or their, their gadget software not upgraded it in the last five years. I'd be shocked these days. <laughs> no, I don't believe you. <laughs> but, uh, but as far as our thinking software, 2,500 years old. Uh, in the Western world, started by the Greeks, uh, when the church got going and was uh, invented the first universities in Europe and the first uh, public education system, which had spread around the world with missionaries into countries around the world, into Australia 200 years ago with rabbits and a few other things, and carrying with them software called Logic, Greco-Roman Logic, which is 2,500 years old. And not bad, it's quite good at sorting, particularly good at protecting the past, particularly good at removing faults from things. If you have a, um, a stagecoach, you can use Logic to remove all the faults from the stagecoach. It'll give you a perfect stagecoach, but it won't give you a motor car kind of thinking that we need uh, for a motor car, we have to completely escape and start somewhere else. Quite dramatically somewhere, start somewhere. So, so that is one of the main problems that we have. We, uh, I, I was looking at this little book that, that was uh, fantastic. It was just great to see some of your pictures and your horoscopes and your famous quotes. <laughs> and it's clear from reading this that you already know quite a lot about innovation. You're, you're not novices. You're not hearing about this stuff for the first time, are you? You know, really, I mean, that's, this is a book on innovation right here. But, but the difference between knowing about it and having virtuosity, being able to do it, and it's quite difficult in some ways, particularly because of how the brain works. Um, what part of the business are you involved in? Packaging Journal. What's your name? Pretty Granny. Pretty Granny. Congratulations and thank you for volunteering. <laughs> <laughs> Is that in India? Yes. Okay, yes. great. So I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions, and if you could yell out the answer but loud down the back so they can hear. Okay. okay. So what, what part of the business are you in again? Packaging development. Packaging and development. Nice, loud voice too. Very good. Okay, that wasn't one of the questions. Uh, okay. How do you spell the word um, shop? Like a like a tobacco shop. S H O P. Very good for packaging development. Okay. Um, <laughs> how do you spell the word crop? Like a tobacco crop. C R O P. Excellent. What do you do when you come to a green light? Stop. Oh, oh. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. Give him a round of applause. Okay, and just to make you feel better, who else thought stop? Put up your hand. Look, you can see. Now, be honest, come on now, who else wants to stop? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, what we illustrated there is a very interesting feature of the human brain. The human brain is an acute patterning system. The human brain is, is, is designed to be brilliantly uncreative. 
Uh, otherwise, we couldn't survive. Uh, if we had to reinvent breakfast every morning, life would be too tedious, we couldn't survive. The main purpose of the brain is work, it does it electrochemically, you know, we don't need to be worried about how it does that, but it cognizes information, uh, which stores the thinking, and then it can recognize that information, and that information can be printed out in, in real time without having to work it all out again, so that we can learn how to live, how to find our way to work, uh, what we need to do when we come to work, how to get dressed, we don't have to remember that every day. And we can get through life pretty well uh, based just on using all of the stored thinking that is stored electrochemically in our brain. Uh, and uh, many people do that and we can get by. So the main purpose is to, is to form patterns in order to use those patterns and then reuse them. Now, how many repetitions are needed to form a strong pattern in the human brain? By the way, this is the audience participation part of it, okay? So, uh, if I ask you a question, feel free to answer. Have, just have a guess, how many, what's the minimum number of repetitions? Two. 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 Okay, two. Um, what did we do here? We did one, because the first one wasn't a repetition, was it? So I said, uh, shop. Then we said crop, which is one repetition. And what do you do when you come to green? And even though you know that you go, because you immediately heard yourself say it, correct? Even though you know the information, the pattern of one repetition is so strong, it can actually make you say something quite different to what you actually know to be the truth. Quite different, not a little bit different, uh, the opposite, in fact. Now that's a pattern built up of one repetition. Imagine a pattern built up over a whole morning, or a whole business plan, or a whole marketing plan, or a whole culture. These patterns can be so strong and so deep that uh, a certain amount of exhortation that we do so is nowhere near powerful enough to allow us to escape from the patterns. And escape is literally the word. Uh, to escape from the patterns, from the rightness and even the righteousness of things that we believe to be true or that we've just learned or had repeated or imitated, which is the main way humans learn, we imitate. Um, uh, most of the people in the world, their religion, not coincidentally, is the same religion as their parents. Yeah, we think of all of the vast diversity of religious beliefs that you could choose from. All have you know different pluses and minuses. All interesting <coughs> long histories. You know, just I mean that could be just a life study in itself. Yet coincidentally, we all have the same religion as our parents. Often the same football team. And so on. And we know why this is right, because we learn through imitation and through patterns and repetition, and then that, our brain gets wired up, and that can be pretty much us for life. So um, it's, it's all very well to say we should be innovative. It's all very well to say we should be creative, and of course we, we know that. And I've seen from reading this book now that you know this very well. But to be able to do it, and to be able to do it with virtuosity, and to be able to do it uh, knowing that there's risk and uncertainty and criticism failure and all those things possibly associated with it is quite a big tall order. So I want to give you a very, very powerful te uh, theory and a very, very powerful technology which we, we know works because it's been proven over the last 20 years or so, many people around the world, and you'll take this away with you today and then it's up to you before it requires an act of will to use it. But you can try it, you can test it out, and you can see how powerful it is. So the value of a switch is it has two positions. Now, if you have two positions, you have at least three very, very valuable strategies available to you. The first one is you have the strategy of escape. Because if you can consider at least one alternative position to the one you have, if you cannot possibly consider any change or alternative than your point of view, then all you can do is maintain that point of view. But if you can consider at least one other possible alternative, to the, the, your current point of view, you can escape from your point of view and switch to that other point of view, can't you? Now, whether it's better, whether it's not better, you have to test and see, but in theory, you can do that. So you have the chance of escape. If you have a switch, you can go from one state to an alternative state, and now we're really getting somewhere. Then you have the possibility, the genuine possibility of innovation, because you can go from an old state to a new state. And that is what innovation is. And of course, you have the possibility of change. We 
talk about change management, we talk about the changing environment. Uh, change, we live in nothing but change. So if you have two states, you can change from one state and you can change to the other state. So it's quite a lot of value, isn't it, in a simple model of a switch. So I'm going to give you a switch now, a cognitive switch, an app for your brain, and uh, we'll practice this a little bit. I'll program it into your brain, and you'll have it for the rest of your life. So if you don't want it, last chance to leave. Please run away now, because within the next five minutes, your brain will be changed, and you can never go. You can never unknow this once you know it. <laughs> once you know this, it's too late. You can never unknow it. You can never go back to the days when I didn't know that. Now it's now. Like the round earth and the flat earth. Once you know the earth is round, it's too late. Okay, so uh, this is a switch which, as I said, Jack Welch would write for a, a General Electric in the 80s and it called it the simplest idea in the world. So the main purpose of the brain when you wake up in the morning, it boots up and now suddenly you remember who you are and where, and where you're going. It takes me a little longer than it used to, but I get there eventually. And then all, all day long, the main thing your brain is secreting what we call a CVS current view of the situation. It's a generic thing that we can. So your brain is doing it, your, your, your colleagues' brains are doing it, your customers' brains, your family's brains, your, your partner, your enemy, every human brain at any particular moment is secreting a CVS, a current view of the situation. Now that's great. That's the main value of the brain. If the brain didn't do that, we couldn't live, we couldn't survive. So the main purpose of the brain very quickly at any moment based on what it has available and what is triggered by what it, what it has available um, gives us a CBS, a current view of the situation. So if I have a CBS, I have a point of view, and there's such a thing as right and wrong, well naturally I'm right and you're wrong. So now there's two reasons why it's difficult to escape my point of view. One is the acute patterning system of the brain that has given me the CBS, and the other one is the uh, the cultural brain software that says right and wrong, it says I'm right. So I spend all of my time defending the rightness of my point of view, which means at the same time I'm not escaping from my point of view to find what we call a BVS. That's the other side of the switch. CVS to BVS. In fact, I'll just ask you if you should be a good sport and go along with me. Just say that now, even though you don't yet know what it means properly, but just say CVS to BVS. Say that now. CVS to BVS. Okay, great. Right. It didn't hurt, did it? It's a bit weird when someone asks you to say something, but it's possible to do. So say it again. Say CVS to BVS. CVS to BVS. Because that's the switch, and my job is to transfer this technology to you, not just tell you about it. CBS to BBS means the current view of the situation is valid, since I have it, so it must be valid. But at any particular moment, such as now, I could escape from my CBS and switch to a BBS. What do you think BBS? In this, in this app, in this software, what do you think BBS stands for? Have a guess. Better. Yeah, a better view. That's the one we use. We deliberately don't use best view of the situation. On first thinking, you might think, wouldn't it be better to say this? But we deliberately don't use that. Why do we deliberately say better view of the situation rather than in this app, rather than best view of the situation? So that we can come back to CBS? So we can keep going. Because in fact, we already have that one. That's the right role system. Most of the thinking, most of the thinking and and if you look in the American Congress, or, uh, all these places, uh, most of the problem-solving time and effort is placed on destroying the other person's CVS in the right-wrong system, rather than designing a ten times better view of the situation. And that's the problem with whether it's a very, very cost. It makes us very slow thinkers because the speed of thought has to do with how long it takes you to escape from your CVS and move to a BVS. The speed of thought has to do with how long it takes you before you can escape from your CV, the deep pattern of your CVS. Does that make sense? Okay, so CVS to BVS. Say that again, CVS to BVS. Excellent, CVS to BVS. So that brings us to what Jack Welch called the simplest idea in the world, which is the, which is the first law of thinking, which is the 
CVS, in the current view of the situation, can never be equal to the EVS, the better view of the situation. So there it is there. First of all, the current view of the situation, which is perfectly valid. That's why arguments are a waste of time. I'm trying to tell you, you don't see the world the way you see it. Well, well you do see the world the way so do I. So CBS is out valid. They're just not right or wrong. So what we need is a law of thinking in the current the situation. CBS can never be equal to the BBS, the better view of the situation. And in this system, we want to give the word better some measurement. Now this is an arbitrary app. This, this is not right, this is not true. It's just useful, it's a tool. So in this system, the relationship between CBS and BBS is decimal. The two states are divided decimally. So um, the BBS is a decimal of the CBS. And in particular, we say X10 or multiply by 10. So um, the law of X10 thinking the CBS multiplied by 10 equals the BBS. So for example, suppose, I, suppose uh, you had a dollar. That's your CBS. What would the BBS be in this system? If the BBS is 10 times better than the CBS, <laughs> 10 dollars. So this is just a very trivial example. Suppose, suppose you owed a dollar. Suppose you owed me a dollar. What would be the BBS now? If I'm owing you one dollar, what would be 10 times better? Oh, you owe me only 10 cents. Or are you, or are you 10 dollars? Okay. So there's lots of BBS, it's okay. But just, just using the mathematics precisely is one way you can do it, or you can use it generally and fuzzily to get the effect you want. You can very often multiply by 10, but dividing by 10 is the same thing in a different direction. It's the, the, the importance is the escape from the CVS. Now these CVSs are so strong that just saying, um, as Steve put out before, you know, a you know a small a small logical improvement uh, is not powerful enough to escape the gravity of the CVS. You get sucked back into the CVS. Um, so we really need a provocation that really gets us out of the gravity of the CVS and somewhere else. Now when we get there, then you can use your logic to see is this good or not. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it isn't good. So then, then what happens? If I go from, uh, I'll demonstrate. This is my CBS. So I say, okay, I need to escape from my CBS. So let me take ten steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's a difficult one. Next. Okay. So now I'm in my CBS. Now I use my logic to say, is this good? Is this right? Do I like this? If I do like it, what can I do? I can use it. I can operate. I can get on with it. If I don't like it, what can I do? Because now that I've moved from the CVS there to this VVS, what does this now become? Which yeah. means it's possible, and so now I have movement. See, in, humans can never be right, ever, in an absolute sense. Uh, my uh, business partner, Edward de Bono, was once giving a talk like this in Dublin to a room full of school principals who were all Jesuit priests. And he's an Oxford Cambridge sort of droll British guy. And he was saying, there's only one being who cannot think. And for that matter, doesn't have a sense of humor. And that being, of course, is God. We can imagine the reaction in the room with jaws <laughs> crashing to the ground and people having strokes and so on. And he said, he said no, if thinking uh, is moving from one state of information to a better state of information, a being which we define as having omniscience, perfect information, could, doesn't need to do that. A being that has perfect knowledge doesn't need to improve on perfect knowledge. But the assumption is that all of us fall somewhat short of the godlike state of total knowledge, so we do have to get involved in escaping from one view in order to move to a much better view. Okay, so CVS to BBS. Say that again. CVS to BBS. Yes. All that means is the current view of the situation is fine, it's valid, I have it. You know, I've worked hard for it, we've invested a lot of money in this, it's got us to where we are, so don't tell me it's wrong. However, it cannot be equal to a BBS that's ten times better. And your lovely story of the 
the old gent, the elderly gent, I think you said he was elderly, who said, let's, uh, let's cut it in half. And what was that the quote again, Steve? About the original quote when you worked on, about what would happen if you were half that best we can imagine from anything else. Yeah, that's an idiot. And that gets you into that quantum leap, the kind of thinking you have to do. We can't do that through incremental thinking. So we've really got to look, we put a man on the moon. Well, we can't do that just by working a little bit harder in the existing plan. We have to come up with a BVS, something 10 times better. And so that's it. And of course, it, that, all of that was only ever done by a human brain. And everyone in this room has one of those. There is nothing separating anyone in this room from being able to do that except the software. If you don't have the software, you can't, you can't play the tune. But you have the machine, you have the hardware. So my job is today is to give you the software, CVS to BVS. Now, imagine you had a cognitive uh, skill that enabled you in any situation to look for things that were 10 times better than the ones that you have. Would that be a useful life skill? As you go through life, if you're able to consider possible futures that were 10 times better than the futures you're heading for, would that be a useful skill in life? If you're dealing with clients uh, in, a, in a business scenario and you're able to look at their CVS and, and diagnostically find out, not just talk about how good your product is, but actually find out about the client CVS in a meeting or over time, and then help design futures for that client that are 10 times better than what they've got, coincidentally using your products and services, um, would that be a useful business skill? Okay, so, uh, so is it worth the one minute and 40 seconds a day that it requires for you to become skilled at this? Because this is how you do it. And we've done this many, many thousands of times. The School of Thinking in uh, its 35 years has sent out over half a billion thinking lessons around the world, and so what I'm telling you is not just something that hasn't been tested. If you will say, CBS to BBS, say that now. Yes. Yes. Perfect, you've got it. If you will say that a hundred times a day for the next 10 days, <laughs> just for the next 10 days, not for the rest of your life, I'm hoping that if you do it for the next 10 days, you will do it for the rest of your life, but just what, would, what do you think, with what you know about the human brain system, which is an acute repetition system, if you were to actually, it takes about a minute, a second to say CBS to BBS. So 100 would be a minute and 40 seconds. Now you can see the military training trainer in me now coming out, can't you? If you were to do, I used to do a walking down Park Avenue in New York, when my left foot hit the ground, I'd say CBS. When my right foot hit the ground, I'd say to BBS, I'd go CBS to BBS. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I could lock you up. But, uh, but you can do, some people do it in the shower, some people driving to work, some people jogging. <laughs> Some people say CBS to BBS in the shower, that's what I'm going to do. So, um, so, uh, so, a couple of minutes, downtime a day, you wouldn't be using for anything else. If you devoted it deliberately, and that's a very important word, if you deliberately devoted that time to, to repeating and practicing, you've got to know what it means, and you do know what it means, CBS to BBS, what do you reasonably think would start to happen uh, in the human brain system? Just while you're thinking about that, I'll give you another one. Suppose you said, suppose for some reason, which it doesn't know what the reason is, but I said it would be interesting to notice red things. And certainly there's plenty of red things in the room. If, if, if for, for the next 10 days, you said 100 times a day, notice red things, notice red things, notice red things, what do you reasonably think would happen based on what you know about the human cognition system? What could you reasonably expect? Yeah, you would start to build the pattern, which you already have, of course, but strong because of the practice and the repetition uh, and the rehearsal, you would start to build a strong pattern for noticing red things. And so just like a carpenter can notice things that they've worked on for many hundreds of hours, over, over time, you would become an expert at noticing red things. Now, everybody, of course, would come into this room and notice the obvious red things, but you'd be able to see those red things that other people do you reasonably accept that as a, a proposition? And you can easily test it for yourself. Okay, so I don't know if there's much value in noticing red things, but there's a lot of value in noticing EVSs. So if you were willing to um, 
invest, because there is risk involved, you, you don't know if this will work yet. So the risk to you is an investment of a minute and 40 seconds a day for the next 10 days. If you'd be willing to invest CVS to BVS, CVS to BVS, this is what I predict will happen. If you uh, do your repetitions today, it, uh, the pattern will stay in your short-term memory. Now, it's the short-term memory is where all the action is in the brain in terms of human behavior. There's lots of things that we know, and someone can tell you in a lecture, they say, oh, yes, don't tell me that, I already know that. Yeah, but are you doing it? So you don't get any value from knowing stuff, but you do get value from behavior, because behavior actually changes the physics of the universe. And so if you say CVS to BVS, you'll be keeping it in your short-term memory, which is where you operate during the day. So this is what I predict will happen. Something will come up in your life. You'll have a report that you have to write. You'll have a business meeting that you have to attend. You'll be going to see a client. You may even have to drive your wife or your partner to the doctor on the way. Or yeah, any of the things that happen in life. Or you may have to choose uh, the way you're going to go about something. Or how you'll behave in a particular meeting. What question you'll ask. What information you will choose out of all the possible information you could choose to, to associate your name with. Um, these things happen all day long. Now, if in your brain you have CBS to BBS, you'll go, wait a minute. There might be a BBS here, 10 times better than what I'm about to do. If only I'm willing, this is my little theatrical demonstration of how difficult it can be to escape your CBS and look for a BBS. And here's the interesting thing. Once you look in a direction, it's possible to see what's there. But the decision to look could take 20 years, especially if you're singing the praises of the direction that you're already looking in, your CVS. So while you're defending the rightness of your CVS, and who's ever been to a business meeting which consists of terribly talented people of complete goodwill, no villains, complete goodwill, terribly interested in getting things done, but sit around the table defending the rightness of the CVS, where at that same time and effort could be devoted to searching for and contesting the BVS.